Well, so I've been on many happy returns. Um, as you all know, yeah, we're now in the middle of uh, the Holy Pascha week. And uh, today um, is uh, Wednesday, right? It's known as Wednesday of what? Arba, Arba uh, Because today uh, there's many, so I just want to actually, I want to spoke about this, uh, about this earlier uh, today uh, in, the, in the morning Pascha. There are many symbolisms between um, the, uh, the sufferings of Job and the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, tomorrow, of course, as you know, is a Covenant Thursday. Covenant Thursday. Um, and yesterday was the day of teaching. Tanat uh, al is the day of teaching where the Lord is teaching uh, the, the, uh, the, the multitudes. Just a word on, on the rights before yeah, we get into the, um, uh, the, the topic. As Abuna also mentioned, um, yeah, we chanted a hymn during the third hour. This hymn is called Abichinun. Abichinun um, is a psalm uh, taken from Psalm 55. As I would already explained, his words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. This same hymn, yeah, the same melody, is chanted four times during Holy Week. Chanted four times. We chant it today in the third hour, and I would already explain because this is um, yeah, the time when Judas started to conspire to deliver the Lord. And why his words were softer than oil? Because even when he went to deliver him, he said, what, peace, master, and he kissed him. Okay, but they were drawn swords because of his heart, he, it's like a dagger, you know, he's, 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 uh, he's uh, piercing him. So we chanted today, and we chanted also tomorrow morning, in the first hour of, of uh, Holy Thursday. The first hour of Holy Thursday, is actually a, a big portion of it is about Judas, and as we, I mean, hope uh, God willing, all of us will come tomorrow. We will see, uh, we we read and we chant the praxis, and it's all about Judas and what happened to him. And then we go around uh, the, the the front of the church here. We do a circuit in the opposite direction. This is the only time uh, that we go in the opposite direction. In, in the church, usually we go which way? Clockwise or counterclockwise? Clockwise. Counterclockwise. In the church, we always go counterclockwise. Why counterclockwise? Because we are against the world. We are against time. God is against time. But this is the only time that we go with the world clockwise because Judas went with the world. So his thoughts, his teachings, which is what we're going to talk about today, his teachings are with the world. That's why it, 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 it led him nowhere. The other two times that we chant the this, this same hymn is when we, when we chant the hymn of Bicca Thrones. Bicca Thrones, which means your throne, O God, is forever and ever. We chanted it yesterday in the 11th hour of the day of Tuesday. Why on the day of Tuesday at the 11th hour specifically? Because if you notice in the reading of the Gospel, all the way at the end it says, Then the Lord ended his teachings. And then he said to the, his disciples, you know that after two days is the Passover, and the Son of God shall be, and the Son of Man shall be um, uh, dri uh, delivered to be, what? Crucified. So, so the cross is the throne of God. So this is why we start to chant your throne of God forever and ever. And the last time that we chant it is all the way at the end of Good Friday in the 12th hour. We chant the same one, your throne of God is forever and ever. Why? Because now we have seen the salvation, we have seen the Lord crucified on the cross, and even though to the whole world this looks like weakness, and even to the whole world this looks like death, but we speak to the Lord and we say, we understand, Lord, that your throne is forever and ever, and the cross is your throne. So today is the day of betrayal, to, yeah, I mean, this evening and, and uh, tomorrow. This is considered the day of betrayal. And it seems that evil is winning. You know, Judas betrays him and he's given up to the, to the, to the priest and, 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 and delivered to, to, uh, to death. Um, so it seems as if evil is winning. But of course, we wait until the end. And of course, at the end, we see that good is winning, that, that Christ overcomes. That's why at the end, we chant, your throne of God is forever and ever. That's why also, Starting from like tonight, we disallow greeting. Like we don't kiss each other, we don't kiss Abuna's hand, we don't kiss the icons, we don't kiss the relics of the saints. This is all to denounce the kiss of Judas. 
because Judas delivered the Lord with a kiss, and so we don't want to yani, partake of this. What we want to talk about today, um, before yani, we get into it, I want us to read yani, two very small passages of some of the readings that we read today. In the 11th hour prophecy, which we just read now in Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah said, How can you say, we are wise, and the law of the Lord is with us? Look, the false man of the scribe certainly works falsehood. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord, so that wisdom they uh, so what wisdom do they have? So here Jeremiah is talking about people who are teaching falsely. Right? People who are teaching falsely. Also in the six hour gospel that we read earlier today, in the gospel of St. John, um, he said, But although he had done so many signs before them, they did not believe in him, that the word of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. So, what we want to talk about today with, with God's grace is how do we identify false teachings and false teachers? That's why the Lord took such great care on the last day before the Passover, two days before the Passover, to teach, to teach, to teach, to teach. Because he wants to make sure that before he's taken away, that the people know what the true teachings are. In, in the epistle of St. John, he says what? Who is a liar? But he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. So, in, in today's world, many people are concerned about the end of the days and the Antichrist and all of this. But actually, St. John here is saying, don't even worry about yeah, the Antichrist as people are expecting it. He's saying anybody who denies that Jesus is the Christ and denies the Father and the Son, this is the Antichrist. So any church, any heretic, any teacher who says that Jesus is not the Son of God is what is, the, is a liar and an antichrist. Like who? Who's, who's one person that we can think of in the church, early church history, who denied the divinity of, of Christ? Arius. 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 The story is denied the hope the Holy Spirit, but Arius denied the, the the Son that he is, you know, the Son of God. St. John also says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So the criteria, the criteria for somebody who is a false teacher is denying the, that the Lord is the antichrist. And especially in today's world, there are many, many, many false teachers. And some of them are in the church. And this is the biggest danger. Compare the era of heresies versus the era of martyrdom. The era of martyrdom, the Oscar is the shed, when people were being persecuted and killed for their faith. Was the church strong or weak? Strong, very strong. After the persecution ended, when, when Emperor Constantine uh, allowed freedom of religion, then became the, the time of the heresies and the ecumenical councils. Why? Because people rested now so they can think. So they start thinking. What happened to the church? Did it become weak or strong? Weak. So actually, the danger is in the false teaching more than martyrdom. Actually, the church is always strong during the times of martyrdom. In the, in the epistle of Second Peter, he says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. He's talking to the Christians. He's saying there's going, there's going to be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways, because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. So there are going to be false teachers in the church, and many will follow them. This is what we're trying to um, learn uh, today. So we are going to identify seven forms of false teachers, 
and we are going to learn five tests that we can test a teaching to see whether this teaching is right or wrong. Okay? So, the first kind of false teacher is the heretic. I mean, heart, the heretic. This is the most prominent and the most dangerous of all the false teachers. Fal this is what Saint Peter said, false teachers among you who secretly bring in destructive heresies, even the night the Lord who brought them. These people, these teachers, they contradict the essential teachings of the Christian faith. And actually, they're very easy to spot. Yeah, actually, this, this kind of uh, uh, teacher, or this kind of uh, false teacher, is the easiest one to identify if we have a good understanding of our doctrine. Typically, this person is a sociable figure, good speaker, good singer, natural leader, teaching just enough truth to mask the heresy. Okay? And so he packages the heresy. He leads his followers from the safety of orthodoxy to heresy. How does he do this? Sometimes by contradicting the truth, and sometimes by adding to the truth. Like if we see in this, in this um, diagram here, if we look in the middle, this is the correct uh, uh, dogma, right? The Trinity is not that the, the Father is the Son and, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit. But the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. We all agree this is the correct Orthodox teaching. If we look on the left, this is Sabellianism. What did he teach? He teach Jesus is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. There's all one. Look at this. There is just enough dogma in there that you can say, oh, yeah, okay, Trinity, yes, yes, we believe in the Trinity. Yes, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we believe in the, yeah. But A, there's, there's like, a, like a nice package, but then there's the error hidden inside. Arius, on the other side, Arianism, he taught that God the Father created the Son, um, who's a lesser God, in order to use the Holy Spirit as a force. Still, we have a Trinity, we have a Father, we have a Son, and we have the Holy Spirit, but he, he changed it, right? He changed the formula. So this is a heresy. The heretic, like Arius, as we said, he denied the divinity of the of the um, uh, of, of God the Son. Nestorius, he de denied the divinity of the Holy Spirit. Actually, you know, I'll tell you the, the creed that was written in, in the Council of Nicaea that Saint Athanasius wrote. Where did it end? Yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit. That's it. They stopped there. The, the rest of the creed was written in the Second Council, in the Council of Constantinople. Why? Why did they stop at yes, we believe in the Holy Spirit? Because Arius didn't say anything about the Holy Spirit. Arius believed in the Holy Spirit. So the heretic, yani, he, will have, yani, he, he will have dogma that looks okay, but being something that, that's, a, that's wrong, and this is what we need to really be careful. Um, Eutychus, and Eutychus is the problem of the whole church split, he redefined the unity. So yes, there's a unity, but he redefined it and caused up many problems. Jehovah's Witnesses, what do they do? They alter the word of God. They change it, and they change it very small, very, very you know, subtle changes. Like as an example, uh, in, in, what, in the epistle, uh, in the New King James Version, the, the, the the, the, the Bible that we follow, it says, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Okay? If we look at the Bible written by the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, it says what? Shepherd the congregation. This is the first change. They change the word church to congregation. Why? Because they don't want to believe in like an establishment of a church. So they change church to congregation. You may not notice it if you're just reading the church to congregation, same thing. Shepherd the congregation of God, which he purchased with the blood of his own son. Very, very small change. The correct one is his own son, or his own blood. This is a, the blood of his own son. But a, there's a difference here. You know, they, they are making lesser of the son. Uh, the Mormons. The Mormons, they say we have the Bible, just like you have the Bible. But they add to it. They add to it in the Book of Mormons. So this is how yeah, the heretics usually operate. <coughs> S 
Saint Jude in his epistle says, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Saint Jude is telling us the faith was already delivered. Nobody needs to redefine it, nobody needs to add to it, nobody needs to change it. It's already been given. So the first type of, of a false teacher is who? The heretic. The, heretic. the second one is the swindler, the Nassau, the swindler. This person, and this is one of the ones I really don't like, he uses Christianity for his own personal gain. And Saint, uh, Saint uh, Paul tells uh, his disciple Timothy about this. He says, if anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which, accord, which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, who suppose that godliness is a, may, is a means of gain, and from such withdraw yourself. This person, as we said, he is interested in how he can fill his wallet. Okay? He doesn't really care about the flock, he doesn't care about the congregation, he doesn't even care about Christianity that much, he just cares to, to benefit himself. And so he uses his leadership position to benefit from others' wealth. We have an example of this in the book of Acts. Uh, Simon the sorcerer. Simon the sorcerer, he saw that by the laying of hands of, of the disciples, the Holy Spirit was given. So he, he thought to himself and he said, what? This is a good business. Okay, let me give some money to the disciples. They will give me this Holy Spirit. And then I can give it to the people, and I can make some money. And actually, I mean, if we think about it, he could have rationalized it in, in, a, in a very I mean, natural way. He could have, I mean, this is just my, my thoughts. He could have went to the disciples and said, you are overburdened, and you have to travel everywhere, but the church needs the Holy Spirit, and we need to ordain deacons, and we need to do this, and we need to do this. So give me this, I will take it upon myself, and I will distribute it to the people, and you can go do something else. Right? Actually, it's, yeah, I mean, it sounds reasonable, okay? But of course the intention was, was wrong. That's why uh, St. Peter told him, your money perished with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. An example from the church history, um, in, in the Church of Rome, Pope Leo X, he's the one who started the, the, the dogma of the sell, selling of the indulgence. You know what the selling of the indulgence is? So somebody sinned, and so he goes to the Pope and he buys forgiveness, okay, and the Pope gives him. And of course, there, there are so many you know, problems and, and, and uh, of course this is unbiblical to begin with, but even it, it gets to the point where somebody can go kill somebody and if he pays enough money, he can get this forgiveness. And, and so Pope Leo, you know, he, he did this and, and he used this money for two things. The first one looks a little bit noble, the second was very bad. First one, he reconstructed the, the Basilica of St. Peter. Okay, this is the outward appearance. So people are like, okay, the Pope is using the money you know, to build a church. But actually, the second part is his luxurious lifestyle. That's why he needed money. He was spending so much money on the way that he was living, which was non-biblical, which was non-pontiff, you know, non-priestly, non-monk, non-anything, and, and he needed more money. Uh, the, the, the televangelists, that we see in, in today's world. Uh, they are this kind of uh, teacher, the swindler. Some of them you may, you may notice, Kenneth Copeland, Benny Hinn, uh, Joel Osteen, we have him in, in Houston. Um, and you see how much their, their net worth is, okay? So obviously, I mean, they are using Christianity in order to benefit uh, you know, the monetary. So the first one was the heretic, the second one was the swindler. The third one is the prophet, the prophet, the Nabi. He claims to be gifted by God to speak fresh revelation outside of the scripture. And there's so many of these out there, but they, they, they are in hiding a bit. So they claim that they have new information, new prediction, new teachings, new review or encouragement. But St. John tells us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And in the book of Revelation, which we read in the night of the Apocalypse, Friday night after we go home after Good Friday, we come back and we spend the whole night in vision. 
Um, if you haven't attended it before, please, please, please come and attend. Please bring your kids, bring them in their pajamas, bring them in, in their sleeping bags. It doesn't matter. Bring them to the church. Let them sleep. It doesn't matter, but let them attend the night of the apocalypse. They will never forget it, and they want to come every year. So in, in the book of Revelation, the very, very end of the book of Revelation, it says what? If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. Very, very stern uh, um, uh, wording here. Actually, according to, a, you know, according to the correct uh, church right, when we read the book of Revelation, it says that as the person is reading, another person is sitting close to him and correcting him if he makes a mistake because of this. Because if, of course, yeah, God is not going to hold it yeah, by the letter, but by, by the spirit. But even the church is, is careful that even at the letter of the law, it's trying to make sure that nobody adds or deletes or, or changes the word of, of, of God. An example of, of this kind of um, false teacher, uh, there's a man uh, by the name of Montanus. This was in the second century. He started to believe in new prophetic revelations. And he predicted the end of times. And he claimed to be the embodiment of the Holy Spirit and began to preach and to write a third testament. <laughs> so now we have the Old Testament, the New Testament, and Montanus' testament. Okay? Um, the Pentecostalism and the charismatic movement, they do a lot regarding this prophecies and God speaks to them and <coughs> speaks in tongues. Um, Joseph Smith in the 19th century. He's the one who, who started the, the, the Mormon church. He claimed that he received the Book of Mormon from an angel, and the angel's name was Morali, that's why they call themselves the Mormons. So, this is the prophet. The fourth type of false teacher is the abuser. And this, is, this is another one that I really, really don't like. I mean, if I don't like the, the swindler, I don't like this one even more, because this is maybe one of the worst, the abuser. The abuser uses his possession, position of leadership in the church to take advantage of other people. The swindler, he cares about money. He wants to profit. The abuser takes advantage of people. And usually, it's usually sexual. Usually. And he, yeah, I mean, many, many really bad uh, examples there. St. Peter says, many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. In, in the epistle of St. Jude, in, in verse 4, listen to this, this is very uh, dangerous. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness. This is in the King James Version. In the RSV Version, it, this word is licentiousness. What is licentiousness? This, in, in, in the NIV, this is much clearer. License for immorality. So these abusers, they use the grace of God into a license to commit sin. Actually, you know, we have a prayer in the church uh, that Abuna prays uh, at the end of the liturgy, and he usually prays it silently. And he says, for Haisotak, um, where the uh, abundance of sin uh, is uh, abundant, then your grace shall be abundant. This means that when we sin, we, we, we are praying that God's grace covers us. But these people, they take this, this kind of dogma and they say, okay, so in order to get the grace of God, we have to abound in sin so that the grace of God can come. Tapan, this is completely Ali. Uh, wrong in, in many, so many ways. The, the abuser. He typically is a charismatic person, good looking, um, you know, uh, speaks well, and he works his way typically on women into their lives, their confidence, their homes, and eventually their beds. If he's not pursuing sexual pleasure, he's pursuing power. And he does all of this in the name of the ministry, claiming that he's God's anointed. God anointed him, so yeah, I can do this. And he uses and abuses others to feed his lusts. Actually, in, uh, in, um, in French history, 
um, Louis the Sixteenth. Louis the Sixteenth, uh, um, he was an immoral king, and at one point, one of his captains from in, in his army, uh, he was betrothed to a beautiful girl, and so Louis desired her, and so he he brought her uh, against her will, and then he committed sin with her. Okay, then after she realized what happened, she started to cry. And he told her, why are you crying? And she said, because we have committed a moral sin, and God will punish us. So what did he tell her? He told her, yes, God will punish you, because you committed a moral sin, but not me, because I am the anointed of God. See how the, you know, the, the abuse of, of power, Maybe some of you may remember this guy, David Koresh. This, this was in the recent history, I think it's uh, 1990s, something like that, or 1980s. Um, this was in Waco, Texas, on dinner. Um, he claimed to be the final prophet. Basically, he, he went as far to, as saying he is the Messiah. And, you know, he, he was encamped in a, in a, in a stronghold up, up in Waco. He called the place Mount Carmel, like uh, Elijah the prophet. Um, and when they finally uh, went in and, and they investigated, they found multiple incidents of child abuse and sexual abuse. Um, he annulled all marriages of couples who joined the group. So if, if there was a marriage, he annulled that marriage because he's the anointed one and he can do whatever he wants. And had exclusive sexual access to the women. So the husbands could not be with their wives, but only he can be with their wives. And he fathered 12 children, and he claimed that he must father 24 children. Why 24? Where did he get this number from? The 24 priests in the book of Revelation. He claimed that he is going to be the father of the 24 priests. The next one is the divider, a mushatak, a divider. He uses false doctrine to disrupt or destroy the church. St. Jude talks about him, he says, there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause division, not having the spirit. These false teachers, what do they bring? Do they bring love to the church? No, they bring strife, they, they bring problems. They bring factions instead of unity. They bring discord instead of harmony. The divider, he can take something very minor in the dogma and make a big deal about it. In the Church of Corinth, if, if you remember um, St. Paul in his first epistle to the Corinthians, he said that what some people are saying, I am for Paul, some people are saying I am for, for Apollos, some people are saying I am for Cephas or Peter, and some people, another faction, they're saying I am for Christ. And he even called this a faction. Why? Because it's dividing the church. And, and he said, who's Paul and who's Apollos? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? Did, did Paul, you know, uh, die on the cross for you? Another example in, from the recent history, I tried to give you something you know, from the old and, and from the new. There was a monk years ago, his name was Daniel uh, Baramosi. Um, he started to preach, he was Coptic, he was started to preach in the Coptic church about the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he took one verse, one verse, which says that he bestows upon us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And he made that into a big dogma. And he would hold like, um, you know, lectures in, in, in the big stadium and go around and touch people like the Pentecostals. Touch people and they fall to the floor and he had an entourage of you know, women and men dressed in white walking with him. And, you know, um, he, the divider may introduce unbiblical doctrines, like the teachings of Balaam and the Nicolaitans that are mentioned in Revelations 2. Um, he may undermine the ordained leadership. We see this so much. I wrote to the churches. This is uh, Saint John. Saint John is the bishop of um, of, um, uh, of Ephesus. I wrote to the church of Diotrephus. So there's a servant there. His name is Diotrephus who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. 
So St. John the Bishop is writing an epistle to the churches, and this servant, I don't know whether he's a deacon or a priest or whatever, he doesn't receive the letter of the, I mean, imagine if Abba Yusuf sent the letter to the church here, and, and one of us said, we're not going to accept the letter of Abba Yusuf. Who, who, who's Abba Yusuf? I, I'm, I'm the one who's going to run things. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds which he does, praying against us with malicious words. Another type of, uh, of uh, uh, false teacher is the tickler. The tickler. This person, he doesn't care anything about what God wants, but he cares about what pleases men. What pleases men. For a time, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And actually, this silence is upon us now. People don't want to hear the truth. So they, they set up teachers and they tell them, tell us that God is good. Tell us that God loves us. Yes, God is good. God loves you. But you must repent. No, no, no. We don't want to hear. Well, I don't want to hear. You must repent. I just want to hear God is good and God loves me. Tell me what I want to hear. Tell me what's, what's going to be. Imagine that you go to a doctor uh, to see the doctor, right? Because you have maybe a growth on, on your hand or something like that. You have some kind of problem, right? You go to the doctor and the nurse comes in. And she says, uh, the doctor will see you shortly, and the doctor loves you. Okay, thank you. I love him too. Okay. Yes. Then you go inside to see the doctor, and you say, doctor, I have this growth on my hand. And he says, I love you. <laughs> and he says, thank you. What about this growth? Don't worry about the growth. I love you. <laughs> Are you going to do any? Are you going to take a sample? Are you going to send it to the lab? Are you going to give you medicine? No, don't worry about that. I love you. <laughs> what, what did I gain? Well, this is what people want. The tickler, he wants popularity, he wants praise. He preaches only the parts of the Bible that people like. Like God loves you. Yes, of course God loves us, but that's not the... Yeah, I mean, there's more to that. He speaks much about happiness, very little about sin. So much about heaven, but nothing about hell. He gives the people what they want to hear. He only teaches a, a partial gospel. Um, like Joe Osteen, he's another example, you know, in, in, uh, in Houston, one of the mega churches in Houston. I like him because of it. Because he tells you God loves you. <laughs> um, look what Jeremiah says, and, and actually, we, uh, I believe we read this in the prophecy, I believe, yesterday. They also, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly saying peace peace when there is no peace I, I remember when i was reading with my kids this this prophecy and they liked this verse so afterwards they went around the house saying peace 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 like that okay so yeah he says peace peace but yes. there is no peace because we haven't been reconciled with god we are still li living the same life that we had before the last uh false teacher the type of uh, type of false teacher is a speculator this is somebody who's obsessed with a, uh, you know, new things, novelty, originality. St. Paul says, do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. And he also says to the disciple Timothy, remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Okay? But this kind of false teacher, he like tosses the Bible aside. And he focuses on very trivial matters, like apparitions, and miracles, and artifacts. We, as a Coptic people, we love these things, right? We love apparitions, we love miracles, right? In every Coptic household, you always find books about, you know, the miracles of Pope Corodos and the miracles of... There's nothing wrong, I'm not saying anything wrong about that. But how many people you will find in their houses, for example, um, on the Incarnation by St. Athanasius, which teaches us the dogma. How many people you'll find in their houses, books that, you know, spirituality, like the books of Pope Shenouda, for example, you know, uh, um, the, the path of spiritual life. 
No, we are concerned more with these things, with the apparitions. I remember um, reading that when, uh, when Saint Mary appeared in Zaytun, they told Pope Cronus Saint Mary appeared in the church in Zaytun. They said, okay. And they said, you mean to go see her? I said, no. I, I see her every day when I pray and I feel her presence. I don't need to go to you know, see an apparition to believe. But we, I mean, uh, many people, this is important to us. Um, the end of time, so many people are concerned about the end of times and calculations and the book of Daniel and all of this. Um, hidden Bible codes, like the Omega Code, some of you may have seen that movie. They're so concerned with interpreting the book of Revelation and what does it mean in the future. And all that. It wasn't written for them. And even if there's a hidden code, this is not what God intended. God intends that we repent, not that we worry about hidden codes. So let's review these false teachers. What was the first one, if you remember? The heretic. The heretic, the heretic he, he spreads a heresy, contradicts essential Christian faith. What was the second one? The, the swindler. He looks to profit from the people, from the church. What was the third one? The prophet. The prophet who preaches something new outside of the scripture. Then the abuser who takes advantage of other people. The divider who uses the doctrine to divide the church. The tickler who only preaches what people want to hear. And the speculator who ignores the core doctrine and is obsessed with trivial matters. Okay, so now we learned about the seven types of false teachers. In the next maybe five minutes or less, we will learn how can we test false doctrine. And we will learn five very easy Five very easy tests that we can apply to a doctor when we hear it. As St. John said, beloved, do not believe the spirits, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we have to, when we hear something new, we have to test it. The first test is the, te the test of origin. The test of origin. Where did this doctrine come from? Sound doctrine comes from God. Unsound doctrine comes from anywhere else. Okay, so the very the first test is very, very easy. Is this from God or not from God? Right? But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the first test, does this doctrine come from God? Or not God. It's, it's, there's no in between. It's either from God or not from God. So let's take um, let's take a, 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 a simple doctrine. God is love. Does it pass the test? First test. Okay. Let's go a little bit further. God is love, and He loves everybody, and He wants everybody to be saved, and He will save everybody. Does that still sound like it's coming from God? Yeah, God, yes, God is love and He wants to save everybody. Okay. The second test, the test of authority. The test of authority. Sound doctrine has its authority in the Bible. Okay. False doctrine is outside of the Bible. In the, in the book of Acts, they said they received the word with all readiness and searched the scripture daily to find out whether these things were so. So there were people, they were being preached to by, you know, the apostles or, or their disciples. And so they received the word, but then they did their homework. Is this really, yeah, what, what they're saying sounds right, but is it really true? Let me research, let me look in the Old Testament, let me look in the prophecies, let me look in the law, right? So the second test, does this doctrine appeal to the Bible for its authority or does it come from some, somewhere else? So. The, 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 um, the statement, the doctrine that, that we're trying to test here is that God is love and He loves everybody and He will save everyone, right? So where's, where's the basis? So the person will tell us this verse, for example, of 1 Timothy. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our God, of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So does this pass the second test? Yeah. It passes the second test, right? So the first test, is it from God? Yes, God is love, it's from God. The second test, is it authentic from the Bible? Yes, it's authentic from the Bible. Very good. 
The third test, the third test is very important. This is the test of consistency. Sound doctrine is consistent with the whole scripture. Okay? False doctrine will not be consistent with everything. Whatever the Bible teaches in one place cannot be refuted in another. Yeah, we, can, we will not find God is love and then God is not love. Okay, no. Yeah, we, 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 yeah, we agree God is love. But we cannot isolate the doctrine by itself and just leave you, you know, the rest of the Bible. So, the third test, and maybe the most important one, is the doctrine established or refuted by the entirety of the scripture? So, this doctrine that we are learning, that someone is trying to teach us, that God is love, He loves all of us, He loves all men, and He will save everybody. Is this consistent with the entire Bible? What do you think? God is love, He loves everybody, and He will save everybody. No. No. Why? He will save those who are willing. So if we look at some examples, some other verses, we put this verse, he, the, 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 the preacher used the verse that God desires everyone to be saved, which we agreed in the second test, that it's from the Bible, right? But now we take it and we put it against some other verses. So if we put it against the verse in John 15, 6, if anyone does not abide in me, anyone includes everyone, right? He is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Oh, we, we don't want to hear this, right? This is the tickler, right? The, the tickler, does, he's not going to give you this, this, uh, this verse. What about this verse in Hebrews chapter 10? If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, okay, so... We, St. Paul's talking about we. He's not talking about them, he's talking about we, the Christians, the apostles, right? We, what do we do? We sin willfully. After we receive the knowledge of the truth. So we have been, I mean, we, we received the truth, we have been baptized, we are members of the church. If we sin willfully after this, what's going to happen, St. Paul? There's no, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. So now, we take this doctrine that somebody was trying to teach, saying that everybody will be saved, and we put it against this and say, no, this doesn't pass the test, it fails the test. By the way, that doctrine that everybody will be saved, this was preached by one of the greatest scholars in the church origin, who taught universal salvation. Everybody will be saved. Up to here, we, we don't have to go any further because it already failed the third test. But we will look at the fourth and fifth test together because they are also going to help us understand. Because even if we say, okay, maybe it passes the third test, let's see what, what the fourth and fifth tests are. The fourth test is a test of spiritual growth. Does this doctrine help me in my spiritual growth or not? And the fifth test is the test of godly living. Does this doctrine have value? For my godly living. So, can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, maybe maybe for, for the benefit of, of uh, a lot of us. Um, I was listening to a lecture given by, by, uh, by a Protestant person uh, who's talking about, uh, obviously, that it's, it's sola fide, which is uh, only faith, and sola gratia, which is only grace. Salvation is only by faith and, gra and grace. And we know they have a lot of uh, verses about from St. Paul, about grace, right? So what they say is that when St. James talks about works, we must understand it in the wrong way. So they're trying to come up with an interpretation of what St. James is saying so that they can pass the second test, that there is no refutation from, uh, from St. James which I think becomes the most dangerous way is that you, you start to, uh, to come up with personal interpretation. Well, I don't think it means that. Yeah. And he wasn't talking about this. Yeah. Uh, which, which I think we also need to be careful about this. Uh, that's, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Actually, uh, yeah, I want to bring up a very important point. If we look at the interpretation, if we want to understand something that, yeah, correctly, 
we should look at the interpretation of the, the church as a whole, not just one person. Because if we take one person like Origen, so he's saying universal salvation, everybody can be saved. He even, by the way, he went as far as saying that the devil can be saved. And this is a, how, how far he went. Okay? But if we look at all the church fathers, we will find that they all agree on the correct interpretation. So I cannot take the one because I like this one and say this must be the right one. Or, like I would have said, I interpret it myself and say, well, I think this is what it means. Therefore, like Arius, you know, the whole church says Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he said, I, I don't think so. I, I don't agree with you. And 318 bishops tried to contend with him, to explain to him that he is wrong. And he still says, no, I, I think you're all wrong and I'm right. Personal interpretation. That, this is, by the way, this is why the Catholic Church, um, at, yeah, yeah, at a certain point, they forbid people from reading the Bible in their own homes because of personal interpretation. This is not right. Mm -hmm. But this is why, you know, that, that happened. Because they said, you should only read it in the church because somebody's going to explain it to you. Well, yes, this part is true. We should read it in the church and somebody should explain it to us. But it doesn't mean that we cannot read it on our own. And also use the interpretations of the, state, the church saints and the church fathers. So, the last two tests here, spiritual growth and godly living. If we apply these two tests to this dogma, the dogma of universal salvation, is the dogma of universal salvation going to help me in my spiritual growth? Absolutely not. If everybody can be saved, why do I have to worry about my spiritual growth? Why do I have to grow? And the, 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 the last test, godly living, if everybody will be saved, why do I even have to live a godly life? I can do whatever I want. Right? So these are the tests that yeah, we need to be, um, yeah, because like I said, many, many false teachings, especially nowadays, especially with the um, you know, internet and, and everybody can say whatever they want. There's no checks and balances. At least back then, if somebody wanted to preach something, they would go to the church or they would stand outside the church and there's checks and balances. There's a priest who will hear them and try to correct them. But today, anybody can say anything. So we, we have to now yeah, the be careful. And these are the five tests just for, for us to review. The test of origin, does this doctrine come from God or not? The test of authority, does it come from the Bible or not? The, the, the test of consistency, does it agree with, with the entire scripture or is it just by itself? And then, does it help me grow and does it help me um, have a godly living? Can, 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 I, can we apply another doctrine that I'm interested to uh... Yeah, very quickly, in, in, in a minute or so, uh, the, the non-literal reading of Genesis, the creation, the account of the creation. Can we go through the, the, the... If somebody comes and says the creation, Genesis 1 to 11, is just literal. It's, it's a poetic type of writing. Uh, uh, yeah, God, God is the creator, but the whole account is more to be taken as a sim symbolism. Mm. Uh, I'd, I'd like if you can just run it through the tests. So, the account of Genesis and the creation. So, does it pass the first test from God? Yes, it passes the first test. Um, is it based on the Bible? Yes, it is based on the Bible. The third test, like I told you, the third test is always the, the, the crucial one. Is it consistent? Does the whole Bible say that this is not really the creation. This is not really uh, what happened. This is all symbolism. No, because actually there are many things that, that the Bible refutes this idea. And, and some things, like as an example, um, for many, many years, people thought that the earth was flat, right? Until Christopher Columbus came and even people told them, you're crazy, you're gonna, as soon as you go to the end, you're going to fall off, you know, the, the earth, right? Galileo. And, 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 and Galileo, yeah. But what happened? If we look at the prophecy of Isaiah, thousands of years before Galileo and Columbus, Isaiah says what? It is he who sits upon the circle of the earth. So, in the Bible, 
there is proof that what was said in Genesis is elsewhere. That God is the one who sits on top of the earth which is round, which he created. Right? This is just yeah, one, one small example, but there are many examples. By the way, yeah, just, since we touched on this, on this point, many people, they try to reason that, you know, some of, uh, some of the, uh, the signs uh, in the Bible may not be accurate or whatever like that. And we need to say one thing about this. The Bible is not a science book. But all the science in the Bible is accurate. If we are looking for science, we don't look at the Bible to learn science. But we look at the science in the Bible to be accurate. The same thing about history. The Bible is not a history book. But all the history that's in the Bible is accurate. Even the Bible itself, if we, if we read in, in the book of 1st uh, and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, there is many uh, references that says what? And the rest of the, of the works of King so-and-so, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So there's history books, there's chronicles, there's other books that has history, and if we want to, we can go to it. But the Bible is not a history book. The same thing, there's other science books, there's other scientists who came up with theories and tested them and things like that. If we want to learn science, we look at those science books. But we look at the Bible, we see the science that's in the Bible, we know it's accurate because the Bible was inspired by the Holy Spirit. That's a, that's a, a, you know, a whole different topic to talk about the inspiration. But we believe that the Holy Spirit inspired the writers of, of the Bible to write what they wrote. And with the, with the Holy Spirit, which is the Spirit of God, would it be saying false information? Would it be inspiring inaccurate information? Of course not. Any, any other questions? I know we're, we're, we're yeah, we, behind times. I apologize about that. Glory be to God forever.